Welcome to this session on innovation. One of our speakers unfortunately has had to drop out, so we have two presentations today. The first from Yusuf Kamra on card sales response to merchant contactless payment acceptance, and the second paper, which was originally scheduled to be presented by Christopher Kurtz, but will now be presented by one of the other authors, Paul Langerman from the Federal Reserve Bank, New Economy, Same Old Consumption, E-Commerce, and Implications for Economic Measurement. We, despite having lost one of the papers, we're going to stick to the original timetable, which means that each presenter will have 20 minutes, and then there'll be 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have a question, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. If you're invited to ask your question, we'll enable you to unmute your microphone. Please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation, and please note this session will be recorded. So I'll now pass over to Yusuf, and uh, we look forward to learning about card sale response. Do you see me? I don't think so. Do you hear me? Okay. We can hear you, Seth. Okay. Wait. So I will share my screen. Okay, great. So good morning, everybody. I'm very, very happy today to be with you. My presentation is going to be on contactless payment. Before starting, please let me introduce myself. I'm a second year PhD student in Polytechnic in France. So this paper, I, I wrote this paper with my supervisor, David Boni. So this presentation outline is as follow. In the beginning, I will motivate our study. And second one, it will be, I will show you the research question and data and estimation strategy. And at the end, I will present the result. And I will conclude. So let's start it. Disparative innovation are happening in many countries around the world, especially in Asia and Europe. In Asia, it is generally digital payment like a QR code payment or simply mobile wallet payment. And in Europe, it is contactless payment. So you put your contact card, your card, and you, you pay without putting any secret code. However, accepting this kind of new technology is somewhat really risky because it is not really, <clears throat> it is not really profitable for business for many reasons. The first reason it is because Consumer are already many digital payment method like a debit credit card. And also it is sometimes difficult for consumer to, to, to accept new payment method because there is sometimes the privacy problem. However, it is also the good way for merchants to adopt this kind of new digital payment for many reasons. First of all, it is the tools to attract new people, new customers, and also to increase the payment from the loyal customer. And after all of this, it is also the good way to fight against fraud. Using, using digital transaction, you can substitute the the, the cash payment to the 
the contactless or card payment to the cash or check payment. So it is very good way to, 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 to fight against fraud and to reduce costs. However, we don't really know the real impact of this kind of, this kind of new digital payment around the world on the real economy. So in this paper, we're gonna introduce, it is the first paper that, that estimates the causal impact on merchant side of adopting new technology and the real impact on the economy. So the background of this paper, it is we use the French market, the French card market. So for your understanding, since 2012, many French markets adopt new digital payment, such as it is generally contactless technology. So to give you some, some descriptive statistic, it is, for example, in uh, 2018, we have almost 76 cards that have contactless payment. Why it is around, it is about 60% for merchants that equip it. So to, to, to really be understandable during this presentation, please let me give you some difference between contact card and the contactless card. So contact card, it is the standard card when you use your card and you introduce in the terminal and you pay. So you need to put your, your secret code. But for contactless card, the innovation, it is you don't need to put your secret code. You just tap it on the terminal of payment and you can buy anything at just few seconds. So our objective it is to use this new technology and to investigate the real impact on the economy. So our research question is as follows. What is the real impact of adopting contactless payment on merchant card sales? And after answer to this main question, we will we can we can break down in many, in many other questions. For example, we can investigate the impact of uh, the adoption of contactless according to the sector, to the size of business, and also to the age of business. And it is also a good way to, to, to estimate the impact on the other payment method. So to try to provide some answer to this question, I will use data from Groupement des Cartes Bancaires. Groupement des Cartes Bancaires, it is like a Visa MasterCard, but only for French market. So if you live in France, if you have a French population, you have a card and it is only for French market. You can buy it anything at any time if you want. So Groupement de Cartes Bancaires have, it is have data from all cards and all merchants in French. So I use this data to try to, to, to investigate many, uh, my question. So to give you some, some variable, some information, for example, for each merchant, we know, for example, the business sector, we know the age of uh, merchants, we know the type of activity, we know the location of uh, the city of a merchant. And we are also able to, to, to compute the, the value and volume of transaction, total transaction made by car. So for our study, we, we use a subsample data. It is only merchants who adopt new technology in, 80, in 2018. So we drop all other 
uh, merchant because before 7 2017 we didn't we don't have able to distinguish merchant who have contactless and not contactless payment so that is why we 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 reduce the simple like that so our objective it is to use two different groups merchant who adopt who accept contactless payment compare to merchant will not accept contactless payment. But the difficulty of this exercise is it is merchants who adopt contactless payment don't usually don't usually comparable because of characteristics, some observable characteristics. It is like uh, if you are living in big city with many many people who, who have contactless payment you be you will be really happy to maybe to to buy to buy the contact uh, to 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 adopt contactless payment so it is sometimes the self selection for consumer you not know, for merchant to to accept contactless payment so it is not really possible to to compare this two group to 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 compare these two groups there is some solution it is what we call quasi experimental method so it is to match two groups so we, we know the group will adopt contactless payment so our objective here it is to use it is to use the merchant who adopt contactless payment and match it that is find the the twins of the same merchant with the same characteristic so merchant who adopt for example have some age so we can use the other merchant would not adopt the contactless and to see to to say that it is the, the twins so something like that so to do that, we need many observable characteristics, but I will show you after the, the, the main observable characteristics. So the, applying this kind of method, we need some assumption. The, the main assumption, it is the common region support. So it, the idea is that in the, in the, we have some area where the probability to buy to to adopt to accept to accept a contactless payment has the same for merchants who accept contactless payment and merchants who do not accept it so that is what you see here in this graph that i call common support so this graph allow us to to apply uh, the, this kind of method on our data but the other problem it is sometimes we 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 don't we don't see the the unobservable characteristic because our merchant is heterogeneous are very different so to try to to remove this heterogeneity we use different in different team setting on the mesh on matched merchants so the, the idea is very simple. So we, we suppose that merchants before adopting contactless payment have the same evolution with the uh, with, uh, merchants who still do not adopt it. So, so the, the, the main assumption, it is common trend assumption. It is we suppose that before adopting the contactless in 2018, the the merchant who accept contactless that i call treatment group have the same the same the same average um, transaction value and the same trans volume transaction so that is what you see, see here so it is the good way to apply for now the, 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 the best method. So difference in different and propensity score matching.
So when I use both of these methods, we have some results. So we can estimate the real impact, the causal impact of accepting new, new technology on the real economy. So for example, let me give you some, some figure. For example, we, I find that merchants who decide to accept contactless payment in 2018 compared to those who still do not increase the annual card sales amount by more than 15%. It is very big. So if you accept contactless payment, your sales will increase. Why the sale can increase? Because contactless payment can substitute to the cash payment or check payment. And also it is a good way to attract new, new customer. So if you are a new customer, they will buy. So adopting new technology, it is very good way to, to, to attract new customer and to substitute cash payment to the contactless or card payment to the contact uh, to the cash payment. So in the second part, we, we are able to, to see the, how the, the impact change according to the, the size of merchant. For example, here you can see that the, the adoption is more benefit for, for the small for the small merchant, while it is not really, really profitable for the larger one. That is maybe we, in the paper we investigate why the different. It is because in the beginning, many large merchants adopt contactless in the beginning, but in the last part, it is generally uh, small, Merchant. That is maybe we we see this kind of difference, and also we investigate the we investigate the spillover effect. So, for example, if you adopt contactless payment, maybe they can increase contact payment. So we investigate if adopting contactless payment is the can be the good way to improve total sales by improving also the contact payment or maybe the substitute contactless payment to, to contact card payment. So investigating this idea, we, think we find that adopting contactless payment increase the contact card payment by it is not really big, but uh, one, just 1%. One but when we, 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 we have a, a look on the by size of merchant, we see that the small merchant really benefit for this, uh, for contactless payment by increasing by almost 18% of the contact card payment. So it is very good way. But something we can see it is negative for impact for the for the larger merchant. That is maybe because larger merchants usually use larger transaction value. So for the for the small for the small value transaction, it is substituted generally by by contactless payment. That is one um, of uh, the argument we, we give in the papers. So something that really interesting and very important, it is to see the, the impact according to the, the business sector. Because you know that contactless payment, it is generally for the small transaction. So maybe the benefit can be bigger for merchants who have already small value transaction. So we investigate here that, for example, we can see that bakeries generally use, make small value transaction, have really 
benefit for the, for this kind of new digital payment. And surprisingly, it, we, we also see that we have a big benefit for the merchant in the leisure sector and sometimes for taxi. And but we see here that we have some what we call cannibalization effect. It is when contactless payment take from the contact payment. And after we, we can also in the last uh, invest, our last investigation was about the how the impact can change according to the business, the merchant age. So we see that newly created business really benefit for the new technology. So we, for example, see that uh, it is around 20, 20, 70% for, for the new entrepreneur, while it is only 12% for, for, the, for the older ones. And we also see that spillover effect on the contact card is very much stronger for the small business. You have five minutes left, please. Yeah, okay, all right. I normally hand it, so. <laughs> and we, we also, try to, to see the robustness of our results. So we use alternative specification. For example, in the beginning, we use matching with uh, a kind of caliper lever. So here we try to, to use different matching methods. So we can use matching with and without replacement because you can, for example, for one merchant, you can see, you can say you are only one twins. But sometimes it is possible to say you are two twins and maybe four and so on. So we, we, we use many other alternative methods and we find almost the same, the same result. And also to be sure that our errors is unbursed, we use placebo tests. So placebo tests, the idea is very simple we use the same methodology on the period where we don't have contact payment. And we also see that there is no significant difference between both groups. So that is the, the idea that uh, how, how specific work very well. So after all of this, we can learn many things. First of all, it is that accepting new technology can be the good way for the promotion of business growth, especially for the small merchant and new entrepreneur. And also naturally, it is also good for merchants who make generally small value transaction, like bakeries and restaurants. And also, when we consider, for example, the impact on other payment methods, we are able to see that it is very good way to, to increase also the other payment method like a contact card and also the good tools to attract new customers. And we can also provide some policy recommendation with this kind of uh, result. So, we know that contact or digital payment is generally promoted by fintech or financial technology company. So it is the good way this paper can be a good way to show to this uh, company that it is very important to, to, to promote this kind of uh, new technology. And for the extension of uh, this paper, we we can also investigate the impact of contactless payment by mobile phone. Because in the data at that level, at that time, we don't have uh, this uh, kind of uh, information. And also we don't have the information of the cash payment. That is why it is sometimes difficult to, to say that the impact come from uh, substitution with cash 
or only for new new customer. So that is the future direction of this paper we can give. And let me say, tell you that uh, this paper has been published uh, in the Journal of Banking and Finance just uh, two, I think, uh, one, one month ago. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm available for your question. Well, thank you very much for that. We you know, haven't had any questions you know, posed by other people, but I hope you'll be able to answer you know, one or two questions that have occurred to me. Uh, okay. First of all, you, know, you mentioned that for large businesses, the adoption of contactless payments seemed to suggest a loss in value of sales and a loss in transactions. And I wondered whether that actually that was something that might cast doubt on your identification process. Because since people don't have to pay contactless when they go shopping, it's yeah. hard to see why giving them the opportunity should lead to a reduction in business. So could you elaborate a bit more how you explained that negative sign, please, and also you know, suggest why, you no, know, given the observation that people don't have to pay contactless, explain clearly why a, a negative sign isn't unreasonable. Yeah, okay, thank you for the, the, this first question. So when we, we try to investigate why the contact payment is, uh, impact is negative for larger merchants, we, we see that generally in the beginning of the, contact, uh, of the contactless adoption, it is generally the merchant, <clears throat> the, it is generally the larger merchant who adopt it in the first, in the first vag of, uh, in the first time of contactless uh, technology adoption. So we, we, we see, for example, if you, you, you take the big, what we call the larger merchant, it is like a supermarket, hypermarket. So generally, it is this kind of, uh, uh, of merchant who adopt in the first time of the contactless payment. And for example, we see in the data that uh, in, 20, in 2018, for example, 18% of larger merchants who already adopt contactless payment in, uh, in 2017. So that is one of the, the explanation of this kind of result. So for me, for example, if you go in the supermarket, you generally buy many things. So you don't use contactless payment for, for buying, uh, you, you use contact payment for buying big thing, but if, for example, you want to, to buy few things, you can use contactless payment. So maybe that is what we see the difference like that. But uh, in the paper, we give more, 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 more explanation for this result. Well, thank you very much. And can I ask a second question? Does yeah, contactless sure. payment add to merchants' costs materially or not? Uh, can you repeat, please? I didn't hear. Really, uh... Does contactless payment add to merchants' costs? Do they have to pay more for having contactless no. payment? No, no, no. So in, in French, it is you have contract. So when you, for example, for for card, when your card the validity of your card is expired. You you can naturally have a new card with uh, with contactless payment without paying anything. For merchant size, it is naturally we we update the the terminal with contact or contactless. So the contract is almost the same. So there is no difference between both. Uh, between having or not having contact payment. So the contract is the same for all merchants. Okay, so the merchant perhaps needs new equipment, but they don't have, they don't have to pay any more for the service. Yes, normally. 
it depends on the, 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 the contract, but normally merchants need to pay anything for new equipment. For example, each year, maybe your terminal, your payment terminal can be changed. So naturally, when we change it, we can up, uh, put the contactless technology on your new, new payment terminal. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Please, could you end your screen sharing so that we can move on to the second paper by Paul Langerman? Yeah, uh, for sure. Thank you um, very much for, for all this question and for your attention. Well, I wanted to add my congratulations that your paper has been published in the Journal of Banking and Finance. Yeah, That's really sure. a great achievement, particularly given the stage you're at in your studies. Yeah, I'm very happy to, for that. <laughs> Thank you. So now could we move on to Paul Langerman on New Economy, Same Old Consumption. Okay. Thanks, Barton. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me and see my slides, but if not, uh, could you quickly uh, let me know? Um, I'll take that as a yes. Um, let me quickly make the usual disclaimer uh, that my uh, uh, that my views are those of are not those of the Federal Reserve that, and uh, and are solely those of uh, Chris and Ben and I. And Chris and Ben are in attendance today as well, and uh, may chime in a bit later during the Q and A. Uh, this is a paper about the measurement of e-commerce uh, and its contribution to U.S. consumer spending. It really started as the confluence of kind of two different lines of research. Uh, first, since I work with the group that studies consumer spending, there's uh, been a puzzle uh, that's opened up over the past decade where aggregate consumption uh, has appeared to have decoupled from its historical empirical relationship with so-called fundamentals like personal income, government transfers, and household wealth. Um, now, while structural changes in consumer responsiveness to economic fundamentals likely explain the bulk of this divergence, uh, it struck us that it also seems plausible that measured aggregate consumption may simply not be capturing spending growth in hard to measure but rapidly expanding components of uh, the economy, such as e-commerce, uh, which is the question we want to push on in this paper. The second area of work that Chris, Ben, and I have all been involved with is kind of attempting to use alternative or big data sources to drive new measures of economic activity. So given Ben's access to some very large scale transactions data from JP Morgan Chase, uh, we thought it might be interesting to use those data to help better explain the use and prevalence of e-commerce uh, by US consumers. So what do we really know about e-commerce? And, and in, in first, just uh, as you'll see on the right of the slide here, um, how is e-commerce even defined? So in, in the US economic uh, statistics uh, produced by the Census Bureau, e-commerce is defined as follows. It's the sales of goods and services where the buyer places an order uh, or the price and terms of sales are negotiated over an internet, mobile device, extranet, electronic data interchange network, electronic mail, or other comparable online system. So in particular, payment may or may not be made online. That's how uh, it's defined by the US Census. And you can see here that uh, Census has started trying to keep track of e-commerce spending. And this chart is measures the share of e-commerce sales uh, among retail sales. And you see it, it's, it's really picked up rapidly from close to zero around 2000 to up to about 10% in 2018. And uh, while we don't have data yet in this paper for the more recent period during the pandemic, uh, as you all know, probably e-commerce spending has surged during then. So I would imagine an even steeper uh, run up in this chart uh, once we can update the paper. Uh, what else do we know about e-commerce? So another thing is that e-commerce is an area where there's been a tremendous amount of product variation compared to typical brick and mortar stores. And it's also an area where price inflation is likely to be low. So on this slide, I've just uh, had some screenshots from some other papers. 
Um, the one on the right is a paper from Brynjolfsson, Eric Brynjolfsson and co-authors that just shows that compared to a typical large brick and mortar store, there's just a tremendous amount of product variety for a, a range of uh, retail goods. And the chart on the left is just showing that, you know, it seems quite plausible, and this is what a paper from uh, uh, Goolsby and Kleenow find, that uh, digital price inflation is just lower than for inflation elsewhere. And so uh, they construct this digital price inflation measure, um, which we're gonna lean on for some of our back of the envelope calculations later, and find that uh, digital price inflation is 1.5% uh, lower per year than uh, CPI inflation for a comparable set of goods, and even up to 3% lower after accounting for all the uh, new goods, so the, tr the tremendous amount of product variety we're seeing online. Uh, what else do we know about e-commerce? The third point I like to emphasize is you saw in the previous chart that the shares of spending for e-commerce is really picking up rapidly, even in the official measures uh, that the US Census Bureau produces. Um, so the rapid shift in expenditure shares towards e-commerce you know, suggests that this long-standing problem of outlet substitution bias could be an issue in published price indexes to the extent that uh, the lower level of online prices that are presumably what's driving that share shift are never compared uh, to those at brick and mortar outlets. So in a 2011 paper with Susan Hausman, Chris and Ben and I uh, used a simple formula, which we have here on the slide, uh, that was uh, derived by, uh, Erwin Dewart uh, to gauge the impact of substitution bias in the context of uh, imported intermediate inputs. Uh, but what we do in this paper is we're gonna use this formula again to, and adapt it to the current context of substitution bias arising from e-commerce. And so the bias in official price measures uh, could be expressed as the uh, products of published inflation, which is the one plus I, uh, the spending share captured by e-commerce retailers, the S, and the level discount in prices, D, uh, for e-commerce retailers. Now, unfortunately, there isn't much available evidence yet for the level differences in prices between e-commerce e and non-e-commerce goods. But one exception, which we'll again lean on for our back of the envelope calculations later, uh, is by Cavallo, uh, who calculated the price discount for goods uh, sold by Amazon relative to in-store sales at large uh, retail uh, establishments. And he found it to be about 6%. Let me just give an overview of the paper. Uh, so essentially, this is a paper where we're gonna try to recast e-commerce growth as uh, measured in retail trade industries into uh, 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 personal consumption expenditures or PCE. Um, now, such a breakout doesn't exist in official U.S. statistics, so I think that's one of the contributions of the, of the paper, is to try to get a sense of, uh, of the contribution and size of e-commerce and PCE. And we, we do, we find from tw the five-year period from 2013 to 2018 that e-commerce accounts for about one-half to two-thirds of uh, real goods consumption growth, despite being only 10 to 20 percent of total spending. Um, we also explore how the e-commerce share might be mismeasured. Uh, I've already uh, brought up some of the areas where that channels where that might be, uh, whether it's through mismeasured prices or uh, uh, outlet substitution bias. And to do that, we're also going to use this uh, extensive data set of credit uh, card and debit card transactions uh, from Chase. Um, and a, a takeaway from this is that these data suggest generally higher and broader e-commerce shares. Uh, than what's uh, estimated by census in the official U.S. statistics. Um, and finally, we're going to do some uh, calculations to quite quantify the sensitivity of real PCE growth to different assumptions about e-commerce shares and the other biases. And uh, I think the, the conclusion of the paper is that there's something for everyone, uh, depending on your priors, about how strong these potential uh, channels for bias could be. So based on a range of assumptions, we're gonna find real spending growth could be just like about a 10th of a percentage point per year uh, higher than official estimates or up to five tenths per year, which is uh, uh, more, uh, more notable. Just a quick overview of the Chase data that we're uh, using in this paper to look at e-commerce and e-commerce shares. 
Uh, this is a data set that contains 39 million, uh, it's a really large, anonymized households uh, that have a banking relationship with J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, it's both, as I said, credit and debit card spending, and uh, all the transactions are broken out by the merchant uh, category code, which we'll subsequently use to map into industries, spending at industries. And this totals about 44 billion transactions and $1.8 trillion of value uh, over the five-year period of 2013 to 2018 that we are studying. And we're gonna construct monthly uh, aggregates uh, from these data to, to look at spending, retail spending. And uh, we don't show it here, but uh, you know, this is still kind of work in progress and there's work to be done to improve these, the spending measure, but the initial results are pretty encouraging that overall retail spending uh, from the Chase data is matching the official data fairly closely, uh, even if it's not uh, fully representative. And uh, improving representativeness is work that remains for another, uh, for uh, the next version of this paper. Uh, importantly, there's a slight definitional difference of e-commerce between the census measure uh, and in uh, the Chase data. And so we're simply going to designate e-commerce as any transaction uh, where there's a flag that says that the card is not present. Um, let's see here. So, uh, you know, the defining characteristic in the chase data of e-commerce is just a lack of physical presence at the point of payment, uh, which is different from the uh, definition of the official U.S. measure where payment may or may not be made online. So it's potentially a slightly broader definition. Now, just a quick look at what these chase data uh, show us for retail industries uh, and, and compare that to census. Um, this is a chart that shows uh, the share of spending in different retail industries. Uh, uh, in blue, it's for the Chase data, and in, re in orange, it's for the uh, census. Um, and you can see some uh, interesting patterns here. Uh, you know, uh, it, you know, it, it's just a really deeper underlying differences between the Chase data and the census e-commerce measures, and that. Uh, for almost all of these industries, the share of e-commerce spending is higher uh, in, uh, in the Chase data. Um, and uh, interestingly, in, in the census data, almost all e-commerce spending is concentrated in this final category on the right, non-store retailers. Um, um, so the fact you know, that virtually all of the overall e-commerce share in retail trade industries is driven by this one non-store retailer industry um, certainly suggests that aggregate differences in e-commerce share are not simply a function of uh, 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 Chase customers being generically more intensive e-commerce users. Now, why might these shares be uh, in the e-commerce data be higher uh, than in, in the official statistics? And in this slide, we just talk about a couple issues, uh, reasons why they might be higher. And the first one is just the uh, cash is the issue of cash payments that uh, obviously we're not ca capturing cash payments uh, in the in the chase data and uh, you know survey evidence in the US finds that about uh, cash is used for about 35% of in person payments so in the paper I won't talk about it much more here we try to adjust for this uh, making some simple adjustments to the chase data. Um, and while that does lower the chase e commerce share a little. Uh, it remains significantly higher than the census categories. Um, other areas where, uh, you know, that could be explained the difference in shares, you know, it's just this definitional uh, uh, different, uh, I pointed out on how e-commerce is defined in the Chase data set versus uh, the census. And finally, I kind of want to push a little bit on this fact that there may just be missing e-commerce uh, in, in the census surveys. Uh, firm reporting in those surveys may inherently be lower uh, than the direct measures we're getting from consumers. So what's the next uh, step of this paper is to try to take these industry level spending measures and uh, convert them into measures uh, of, of real consumption. What do they mean for real consumption? And so uh, again, three issues where uh, the, uh, to, to think about is the allocation of this spending. Uh, some e-commerce spending could either be mischaracterized or as brick and mortar or just missed. Uh, census surveys 
uh, uh, the firms in the census surveys may just not know how to report uh, e-commerce or the, the, the sampling frame may be missing some of the more dynamic uh, firms in, involved in e-commerce. Uh, again, uh, deflation is another issue. If e-commerce has you know, lower like-for-like -like inflation than brick and mortar, uh, uh, this, this will be an issue for the uh, growth of uh, the measurement of real consumption if that's not accounted for in official statistics. And finally, this issue of substitution you know, that I've mentioned that measurement error due to shifting shares uh, could be a problem as consumers substitute across outlets. So the next step of the paper is we want to try to develop a methodology uh, to translate measures of nominal retail spending into personal consumption or PCE. Um, and so in the official st statistics that in, uh, put out in the United States, uh, uh, estimates for most categories of PCE goods as well as food services are prepared using this so-called retail control method. Uh, which is a, a detailed translation of spending at retail industries into spending of different categories of goods uh, based on a, some detailed 2012 data that maps uh, uh, sales and in industries to commodities. Um, now that's uh, too complicated for us. So we tried to develop a regression based framework to approximate this translation. And that's what's shown in the bottom of this table. So. Uh, that this is comparing uh, the published estimates for retail control in five broad sub-aggregates of uh, components of retail control uh, to the ones that we've managed to derive from our baseline regression approach. So you can see they're we're really quite close, and this is not just on average over the five years of data, but if you were to look at a chart of plotting the monthly comparisons, that it also looks very good. Um, so. Uh, this gives us some confidence that we can use it uh, as approach to decompose real PCE uh, uh, spending into e-commerce and non-e-commerce components uh, to get a sense of how quickly real e-commerce spending has been rising in recent years, as well as its contribution to overall PCE. And uh, we also are then going to use this translation to create alternative estimates of real PCE based upon different assumptions about e-commerce shares, you know, the census shares versus the Chase shares or some other shares uh, and e-commerce prices. And we're, we're hoping that this will let us bound the extent of possible measurement from for real PCE from sending from e-commerce. Just get to those back of the envelope calculations that I'll show you in a second. Um, uh, we're gonna consider three possible measures of e the e-commerce share. Uh, uh, the census ones, the chase ones, and also something which I'll call mixed shares, uh, uh, which are uh, assumes the census e-commerce shares are uh, correct for big uh, non-store retailers like Amazon, but it uses the chase e-commerce shares for all other retail sales industries. And the idea from that is that this is going to give us uh, a scenario where shares are e-commerce is, gr is growing the fastest. So it's kind of an upper bound scenario for how fast uh, uh, e-commerce uh, could plausibly be rising. And then we're going to interact these share assumptions with three different assumptions about uh, deflators for e-commerce. And we're going to contrast the published ones where, uh, again, they don't differentiate between e-commerce and non-e-commerce uh, prices for goods uh, with some estimates of uh, the bias estimates from Goolsby Clino, and Clino, which suggests that, that uh, uh, e-commerce prices could be one and a half to 3% lower uh, the inflation per year. And finally, we're gonna roll in the uh, outlet substitution bias adjustment um, uh, that I mentioned before uh, using that formula from DWIRT. Ooh. Let's see here. Let me just show, quickly show some results from the paper. Uh, this is using census shares, and the first column here is using published prices. Uh, and so I think this first column is kind of interesting in that, uh, you know, the, we're decomposing the published growth uh, rate, annual average growth rate of PCE in the top, that 4.4%, uh, into contributions from e commerce and non e commerce. And again, uh, this is not doesn't exist in official statistics. And you can just see the much more rapid growth of e-commerce uh, 
uh, product categories here relative to non-e-commerce. And using these shares and prices, it implies that e-commerce spending, you know, it's growing about 27% per year uh, and accounts for about 41% of total real PCE uh, growth uh, on average during this period. Um, next, you can just uh, see how those results change if we, if we change our assumptions about e-commerce uh, price inflation. Um, so uh, uh, here we apply the e-commerce spending in each of the five, uh, to, we apply to e-commerce spending in each of these five categories, uh, uh, this assumption about uh, uh, e-commerce price inflation being 1.5% 1, 1 lower or 3% lower. Uh, and under these scenarios, you know, real PC control growth is somewhat higher than under the baseline. So you can compare the 4.4 in the top left to 4.5 in the middle to 4.6. Um, so, and, and, and under this scenario, again, it's not shown here, but e-commerce can account for just under 50% of total PCE growth under the uh, two of these two alternative price scenarios. Um, the final three columns layer an adjustment for outlet substitution bias to sh onto the share and price assumptions. So uh, for each of the five sum components of PC retail control, uh, we calculate the e-commerce share shift and assume an e-commerce price discount coming from Cavallo of 6%. And uh, again, correcting for outlet substitution bias boosts average annual growth by an additional tenth of a percentage point in each scenario. So depending on your priors, uh, we've moved from 4.4% growth in the published estimates to between 4.5 and 4.7%. So a couple more tenths per year. You have five minutes left, please. Great, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm getting to the end here. So uh, just to uh, show you some results, similar results where instead of using census shares, we use the so-called mixed shares, which is a, a blend of uh, census and chase shares, mainly chase, but it's designed to come up with an upper bound for the, for the, uh, uh, the scenario where e-commerce could be growing most rapidly. And here, um, if you compare the top row of uh, this slide to the previous one, you see that average annual real PC growth is an additional tenth or two stronger. So, uh, you, and so you can get to about a half percentage point per year in the most extreme comparison, say from the 4.4% of published to all the way on the top right, the 4.9% with uh, the, the most uh, ex extreme mismeasurement for prices and uh, after adjusting for substitution bias. Um, so that, those are the highlights of our results. And just to conclude, um, you know, while our work is still preliminary, uh, I think these results highlight the possibility that e-commerce uh, is probably underestimated in official statistics. Um, and uh, the associated measurement errors in real PCE, uh, you know, seem, I think we have the sign right. It seems to be more a matter of extent than direction. Um, so. If one is skeptical about the applicability of, say, the Ghouls being clean out digital price results, uh, published real PCE control growth appears to have been understated by, say, a, more of a modest one tenth of percent per year. That was the four and a half versus the 4.4 percent that I showed you earlier. Uh, however, if, you've, if you're inclined to believe the Ghouls be clean out results and think the higher Chase e commerce shares are convincing, uh, then published growth may have been understated by a more significant five tenths of a percent per year. Um, and I, I would say that would start to add up uh, uh, over time. Um, again, this work is still fairly preliminary. We have a lot of next steps to uh, get to work on. Uh, first and foremost is we'd just like to update these results with more recent data. So you know, e-commerce has exploded during the pandemic. So this may further exaggerate the measurement, mismeasurement trends we're documenting. Um, and there's still some work to adjust the Chase data to try to make it more representative. Uh, and we'd also like to refine our e-commerce share and uh, price deflator assumptions a bit more. And, and finally, uh, while I didn't talk about it here, the paper also has some results for service sector spending. And quite interestingly, we see there that the e-commerce share differentials are much uh, more, are even more stark between the Chase data and Census. So it suggests a much larger e-commerce share in services spending. And uh, to the extent that's true, it certainly increased the size of the measurement error for overall consumer spending and, and for GDP uh, a fair bit. 
with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Now, we have actually two questions from Tony Cox. So, Caroline, please could you demute Tony so that he can ask his questions? Tony, would you like to speak? I've unmuted your microphone. I believe he just wrote that he doesn't have a mic on his uh, on his computer, so perhaps we could just read out the, the, the questions. Uh -oh. I yes. haven't seen the question here. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll read out the questions. When comparing e-commerce sales against store purchases for the same items, are you able to confirm that the sales are truly like for like in terms of the associated terms and conditions, e.g. guarantee periods and delivery options? That's a very good question. Uh, we obviously would like to be able to compare like for like, uh, and I don't think uh, we'll ever be able to do that uh, perfectly well in that we are sort of just trying to map uh, sales at industries uh, 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 from merchant codes to industries and then translate that into goods space based on uh, some historical relationships. So uh, absolutely, that's something in the background that, that uh, we haven't fully uh, adjusted for. I don't know if Ben or Chris want to add anything to that, but. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so that's, that's obviously something we'd like to control for in terms of the quality differences across uh, different types of products. Uh, one that's probably uh, might be an impossible task at the level of total, uh, you know, total retail sales uh, and, and its contribution to PCE. Uh, and so, as Paul mentioned, we observe uh, our unit of measure is at the merchant category code. So, within a merchant category and for a specific consumer, uh, we see the breakdown between e-commerce and, and non-e-commerce spending. Uh, in our in our defense, I guess uh, when you think about what we're comparing to, which is census. Uh, there as well. There's no, there's no um, information about like for like. There, it's a question of firms reporting a share of their revenue, which is, uh, which is either uh, done via e-commerce or not e-commerce. And so I think, I think it's still a fair comparison to official statistics. Uh, and I think in the future, we'd probably have to rely on some type of case study uh, where we actually have the, the characteristics of the items to, uh, to, to make that uh, kind of the, the leap that, that you're suggesting. Right. I think the only way you would get at that is through a more detailed, complementary sort of case study for a really subset of uh, transactions, a small, smaller subset of transactions. Okay, thank you. And Tony's second point, as well as PCE growth, your analysis appears to have implications for the reported inflation level. Do you have any comments on the implications for inflation targeting by, well, Tony has said governments, but as a former Monetary Policy Committee member, I have to say, by central banks. <laughs> I should tread carefully there. Uh, stay away from inflation targeting, but uh, absolutely there's implications for uh, in inflation from this, and it, it suggests that, uh, you know, if, if we, uh, if e-commerce inflation is, uh, is actually lower, and uh, we are not, we're not capturing that right now in the way the U.S. Uh, measures inflation, and uh, you know the the, the work on uh, on outlet substitution bias, the rapid share shift towards e-commerce is a long-standing issue in price mismeasurement, uh, even back uh, in the Boston Commission days, and so that would also suggest that uh, that inflation re may be uh, a little bit lower. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. Certainly, studies in Britain have suggested other reasons why inflation might be higher. For example, the tendency to replace disappearing goods rather late in the product cycle when they're heavily discounted. But anyway... Uh, you're right. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but anyway, I mean, this has been an absolutely fascinating session on two you know, aspects of e-commerce, well, contactless payment and then e-commerce. And 
I'd like to thank both speakers very much for this, for their presentations. Could I also remind you, please, that the poster session will be held at 5.30 this evening, and you can log into that from the main screen on your landing page. Thank you very much to the participants, and thank you also to everyone who's joined this session.